Um, hello, and welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brooklyn Booksmith, featuring C.S. Picot for the launch of her new book, Dark Rise, with special guest moderator, Victoria Schwab. My name is Adam Schuhos, and I'm the events admin at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, whether you know us well, or this is your first time hearing our name, thank you so much for being a part of our community today. And thank you so much for supporting an independent bookstore through your book purchases. And thank you for supporting the wonderful work of C.S. Picot. I first want to thank Victoria Schwab for joining us this evening and moderating tonight's event. Victoria is the number one New York Times bestselling author of more than 20 books, ranging from middle grade to teen to adult. Her books have garnered critical acclaim and been featured in the New York Times, Entertainment Weekly, The Washington Post, and NPR. They've been tra uh, translated into more than a dozen languages and been optioned for television and film. Schwab, an avid traveler, received her MFA from the University of Edinburgh, where her thesis was about the presence of monsters in medieval art. Thank you so much for being here, Victoria. My pleasure. Now, it is my utter pleasure to introduce our star for this evening, C.S. Picot. C.S. is the best-selling author of the Captive Prince trilogy, personally one of my favorite book series, as well as the graphic novel series, Fence. She lives in Melbourne, Australia, and you can find her online at cspicot.com. Now, it's a joy to say, please join me in welcoming C.S. Picot and Victoria Schwab. This Thank is you the part so much, Adam. Adam goes wild, right? This is where we have to imagine the audience. <laughs> How are you doing? That's right. Um, I'm doing really well. And um, I think the first thing that I wanted to say was thank you so much for doing this in conversation. Um, and just to let the audience know that I have been a fan of Victoria ever since Vicious, which she just blew my mind by telling me came out eight years ago. Um, and um, and uh, I read Addie LaRue. Uh, it's probably my favorite, the, uh, your newest release, um, probably my favorite book that I've read in the last couple of years. So if there happens to be anyone in the audience that hasn't read Addie yet, um, <laughs> run now to your local Aww. bookstore. Hook, it up, hook yourself up with Brookline and Thank grab a copy. You. Well, look, we're not here to talk about me, though. I appreciate that plug because that then liberates me from never having to mention myself again in this because we're here to talk about you. Um, just to give a heads up to everyone watching, uh, rather than kind of like try and chuck all of your questions into the last 15 minutes, I will try and incorporate them throughout. So use the Q&A box and then in about 20 minutes or so, I'll start folding those into our conversation so that... We can get to as many of those as possible. If I don't get to your question, I'm very sorry. I'm gonna go with the most organic form of the conversation possible. And also I'm a giant nerd who really is interested in the creative process. So I'm gonna ask a lot of process questions because those tend to be spoiler free. And I don't know if you didn't know this, but like this book just came out. And unless you were like me and got to read it early, which is definitely the best perk of being an author, um, then you need to, you're probably not done with it yet unless you have set this day aside. So CS, hi. Um, first of all, I know that like there's a question that authors tend to cringe when they get asked, which is like, what's the inspiration for your story? But I know that you won't cringe away from this. And I happen to have a way that I like to ask the question that I think Ooh. helps, which is that I think of books as a meal. And if that's the case, then one of the first things we do as writers is begin to gather the ingredients for said meal. And so I'd like to know what were the initial ingredients that you gathered for Dark Rise? Uh, it was it was two things. So I grew up reading um, these kinds of English pastoral fantasies, Lord of the Rings, Narnia, the Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper that my title is a direct allusion to. Um, C.S. Lewis, with whom I share a C.S. Um, and, um, and I loved those books. And yet on some level, uh, I felt that they excluded me. So these books always had like, you know, a straightforward English lad and he's much trudging across the green and pleasant hills and saving the world while eating hot buttered toast. And, um, and, uh, and I think um, I yearned towards that kind of simplicity, but the place where I saw myself represented in those stories was never in the hero. Uh, it was always in the villain who was in the, the strange fellow over yonder who was like <laughs> um, othered an outsider, often queer coded or actually just queer. Um, and, um, you know, I was probably about 15 or 16 when I 
realized that every Disney villain was queer. Um, uh, Scar, you know, Ursula, Maleficent. <laughs> well, All the best characters, at the very basically. Least. <laughs> yeah, and I just did a huge rewatch of um, the Marvel series, uh, Thor series, leading into the Loki TV series. And I saw it again. Um, got Thor, our strapping heterosexual lad. And, um, and then his cast of queer villains that he fights, Loki, um, um, Kate Blanchett, a gay Hella. icon playing Hela. Yeah. Uh, and um, Jeff Goldblum doing his campest ever performance as the Grandmaster. <laughs> so, um, so I was constantly seeing just facets of myself in the villains. And it meant that those were the characters that I empathized with, identified with. Um, as a kid, I often had this feeling like, just give them a chance. <laughs> Maybe they'll surprise you. But it was my childish way of thinking like, just give me a chance. I'm not a bad person just because I'm just because I'm queer. Yeah. Um, and so um, and so I wanted to take one of those classic battles of good and evil um, and play around with it step into um, some of the villains and see how, what I could do to destabilize um, th those um, ideas of light and dark uh, as much as I could so that if I could get to a place where the reader is white knuckling it like oh my god what is what is going to happen that was my goal um, so that was one of the ingredients so that was the 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 aim the second thing that happened was that I had a visit to the Louvre um, and it was my first time to visit, you know, one of those really world-class museums. Um, I've since been to the Louvre, you know, the London Museum, the Met, um, the museum in Cairo. But at that time, I hadn't really seen anything on that scale before. And it's so disturbing, all those displaced remnants of forgotten lives, especially because I'm, I mean, there's, there's worse excesses of the Louvre and, the, uh, and these museums, but especially because I'm Italian, half the Louvre is just stuff from <laughs> Italy that Napoleon brought back in a sack. Yeah. Um, and um, I started to think about a long dead magical world, um, the kind of artifacts that it might leave behind. Yeah. Um, so that was my second ingredient. And then um, I think my final ingredient was a reread of Lord of the Rings. Um, when I got to the, the line where Gandalf says to Frodo, I wish I had not, oh no, Frodo says to Gandalf, I wish I had not lived to see such times. And Gandalf says that is not for us to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time we have. And, um, you know, Tolkien had kind of fallen out of fashion. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, yet those words seem so relevant right now. <laughs> I wish I had not lived to see these times. I really felt those well, words. And I thought, oh, Tolkien always denied that his book had anything to do with World War II, but he did write it in the shadow of two world wars. Um, it's about fighting a dark force that threatens to overrun and ruin his world. And I just thought, oh, maybe it's time again for a book about fighting. Yeah. Yet one of the things that is old fashioned about Tolkien is the villain is always without and never within. So, yeah, so those were my three main ingredients. I love that. And I think that it's just one of those things where having eat, having had the meal, having devoured the book, uh, it's so exciting to me to be able to then hear how it came together and hear what, because I think that, that, you know, novels are truly greater than the sum of their parts in that way. But I think knowing the parts only adds to an appreciation so that you can track. Because I think sometimes we obviously as readers get a glimpse into the writer's space, but only in the finished product. And I think this is kind of like dropping, I always pictured as like dropping little ink drops into water where like we get to see underneath the surface and kind of see what it makes inside your head. So thank you, I, I love it. I'm like such a nerd for hearing the origin stories of the stories that we tell. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about transition, how you felt transitioning from series to series obviously transitioning from the Captive Prince trilogy to this new trilogy. Um, did it, what surprised you? What was difficult? I mean, a sophomore work is always challenging. The second book in a series is always challenging and the second series is always challenging. So what was the experience like for you? Um, everything, yeah, it, it was a, a really interesting experience. So 
Um, I actually had started to have the ideas for Dark Rise quite a long time ago, almost a decade ago. And I'd never written a novel before. And I knew, I knew that this book was too hard to write as my first novel. Um, I mean, some people get like some books um, for those in the audience who are not writers, like some books just are more difficult than other books to write. Like certain things that you, yeah. you've experienced this, Victoria. Yeah, certain I was going to say Addie was. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> because Addie has like these kind of like, there's the unwritten text, there's, there's, there's invisible things that are happening that you also need to be in control of. But similarly, um, I had that realization of, oh, I'm not ready to write this one yet. I need to be a better writer before I do this one, or I need to have yes. more experience. So I get that. Yes. And, um, and so uh, I thought when I started out, oh, just write a novel as practice. Um, and that novel was the Captive <laughs> Prince series. Not bad um, practice. And, <laughs> well, for those who don't know, like that book started off as a, a web series. It was like online original fiction. And um, as, as a result, it was written like one chapter at a time. It's pretty much published exactly as it appeared online. And so you can watch me learn to write through the yeah. course of that book. Like if you, as I gradually learn different techniques, suddenly they appear in Captain French. Like I don't know. Halfway I'm still... through book one. I'm still very angry at how good it is though, because most of us learning behind the scenes are like, that's trash, that's trash, that's okay, that's not quite trash. And instead you have this like phenomenal trilogy that if that's your education, like way to put it into practice as you're going. You can, you can certainly see it though. Like, uh, um, <laughs> you know, about three quarters of the way through book one, I learn how to do a B plot and suddenly a B plot appears. <laughs> um, and so I was learning like all these things. And I thought then when I, um, when I approached Dark Rise, which is a lot more ambitious, um, that I was ready. And then I was not ready. Um, <laughs> there was still so much to learn. It's, um, there was a lot that I need to learn about world building. Um, and I ended up spending a ton of time really just poring over texts that I felt had an excellence in world building, trying to reverse engineer techniques that they use that I could then bring into my toolbox and use in Dark Rise. Um, it's a much larger cast of characters. Uh, it has multiple POVs, um, which is also does add sort of a level of difficulty. And then I guess I like to write twists that um, if I can try and create like a paradigm shift, the kind of twist that backlights what's come before as well as puts you on new footing going forward. Um, but that often means that you're writing like an apparent, like an apparent plot <laughs> and then an actual underlying plot. It's two plots at the same time. Um, and so that was very difficult as well. Um, so, um, but I, I love, one of the things I love about writing is learning, learning new skills and enlarging a skill set. Um, so that was the aspect of that, that I really enjoyed as well. I love that. Um, when you now, how much do you plan? Because obviously you're talking a lot about learning and educating and looking at other things with a, that writer's eye. But when it comes to actually breaking story, um, so like for instance, I know all the endings to my stories before I start writing them, and then I rewind to kind of figure out where I start based on where I end. It's like the only I've rewritten right. books from scratch multiple times, but the 21 books in, my endings have never changed from where I like. The endings plan. have never changed. The endings have never changed. The whole book. So for you, changed. it's an experience of sort of writing towards something. For me, I am like executing an idea. And the excitement to me is like, how do I get there in the best way possible? But I'm right to, to go back to the meal analogy. I am fixated on the taste that's left in your mouth at the end. Cause I think we wreck con a lot of our experiences based on how we finish and so I like am searching right. for the most satisfying ending and then working backwards from there so but because of that I also just like I'm just like for my own anxiety I like to structure and plan because I think I would quit because I'd get scared and convince myself I couldn't do it so I'm just curious especially with such a, a complex series and such an ambitious series like Dark Rise like how much do you plan before you start for both that book and for the arc? Yeah, I, I plan, ev I do plan everything beforehand. So I, I've definitely talked to writers, you know, for him, they say that it's the excitement of discovery that pulls them through the book. And for me, there's no excitement in discovery. I just feel a terrifying fear of the unknown. Like it's okay. almost this frenzied, horrible feeling <laughs> that, um, 
if I don't know what's coming, that perhaps um, the, I don't um, like, I, I'm not necessarily a writer that has a lot of ideas that are always bubbling up. So I have to do really active things to find story and to break out story. Um, and so if there's nothing in front of me, I'm just like, oh God, there's nothing. Um, and so I plan everything beforehand. Um, but I, I feel like it's, um, there's some things that I, I, I personally can't achieve if I don't plan. Mm -hmm. So especially across series. Um, if you're trying to lay minds in book one, that's going to go off in book three. You really need to know yes. <laughs> what happens in book three, um, or at least I do. Um, I am, I'm relieved so to hear that only because I would obviously like do my best to understand if you're like, no, it just comes out like that. I just find my way through the dark, but it makes me so deeply anxious every time I talk to a writer yes. who can do that. Cause I'm like, no, <laughs> no, you can't. And I will say, I want to, I want to correct one fallacy that readers might have in their mind, which is that those of us who plan and who strategize and who structure, I think there's this idea that we don't get the enjoyment then that those who make discoveries along the way do. But I don't know about you, but I find a lot of the enjoyment in the strategizing, in the planning. Yes. For me, the enjoyment comes at almost the outlining instead of the just dis the discovery is there. It's just at an earlier stage. Yes. And um, yes, like you, I find strategy to be really enjoyable. And I also really enjoy problem solving. Um, and um, so when you're, I guess, planning a whole series and trying to reach an endpoint, there, there are, there's often a lot of strategic problem solving along the way, which is something I really like doing. Um, so, so yeah, I think, but I think a lot of people like you do, writing is so broad in scope that you make it into what you enjoy. Like if you love research, yeah. then you write books that just need a ton of research. And I mean, um, I think I think it's just also like, yeah, it's knowing, I think it is really just knowing what will keep you going because it's such a yeah. lonely, slow, hard process. And it's a beautiful process, but like I once saw Neil Gaiman compare it to living in Groundhog Day because it's, it's on the minutia of day to day. You're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and hoping that you have like one step of progress a day. Um, yeah, and, and it's I, very psychological as well. Like you're yeah. drawing continually on the self and it's not just that you're creating the novel out of yourself, but you're also drawing on the self in terms of things like sustaining self-belief over the yes. course <laughs> of a year or a year and a half that this novel is going to turn out well because, um, you know, very often books aren't that you're writing manuscript is not good until the very end. <laughs> so you have to believe that a mess is going to resolve yeah. um, as you... Well, unless it. you're C.S. Picot and then you apparently like were good as you were going along writing Captive Prince. So I'm going to be bitter about that forever. Um, that's fine. Um, no, you're, you're totally right. I do think there's there's so much self-sustaining that has to happen that you have to find mm. whatever it is that brings you joy. And if like the joy is in finding your way through the weeds, that's fine. For me, the idea of wandering 50,000 words in the wrong direction gives me such deep dread <laughs> that I don't want to do it anymore, you know? Yeah. Whereas to me, the the I have such an excitement, a satisfaction that comes with having the discovery at the planning and then executing it. And if I yes. can execute it to like the standard it was in my head, usually it can take many, many rounds. But that to me is like, that's my gold. Yes, yes, and yes. I feel like we're very similar yeah. in this regard. Wonderful. Um, wonderful. Yeah, and I, it's, it's um, actually really wonderful and refreshing to um, speak with a writer who's not just like, oh, the muse strikes me no. and then... I'm just a natural writer that just, it flows through me and then I have an amazing book at the end. It's, no, it's not that experience people. to me at all. No, screw um, those people. I, <laughs> there is no, there is no right way to write and everyone's way is valid, but also screw those people who are just like, it's joyful. Yeah. I'm like, it's not joyful. Like it's, it's exhilarating and it is agonizing and it is very atlas-esque in that like I um, have like on the verge of panic the whole time I'm writing a first draft because I feel like I'm holding the entire story aloft in my head and I can only put like one tiny tiny speck of it down on paper at a time and the weight is just like on top of me being like don't drop it don't drop it it'll break <laughs> yeah yeah great it's great is what we're saying it's wonderful um 
Okay. I want to, I have questions. I wrote them down because it's late and I knew that I would. Okay. Let's, let's do an easy one real fast. I'd love to know, yeah. uh, before I ask you some more story writing questions, I'd love to know what's bringing you joy right now. Well, um, what's bringing me joy right now? Well, um, so I'm in Melbourne, Australia, and we've had um, actually the strictest lockdown in the, and longest lockdown in the world. We officially surpassed the Buenos Aires, um, and we're now the most um, locked down <laughs> population. Um, so um, I think when you're um, when you you when your existence kind of narrows so much, um, what I have really found is that it's it's whittled me down to the basics and very very simple things bring me joy seeing another human <laughs> and speaking with them, you know, human connection. Oh, yeah. um, I've, I've, it's almost like I've realized how important it is over the last year, uh, something that I took for granted and is actually so essential to my existence. Um, nature. I, I got to the point where I would go for my hour a day walk and fall into like a mesmerized stupor looking at a flower or a leaf on a tree. Um, and, um, and, and, this is going to sound strange, but newness, new things, new sensory input, yeah. seeing new, seeing things I've never seen before in with my eyes, uh, having a new ex, um, emotional or sensory experience, um, just brings me like almost disproportionate amounts of joy currently. I love it. I love it. I, I think this is a time wherein we don't get a lot of big joy, and therefore we realize how absolutely vital small joy is. And yes. that like in times like these small joy can actually be the sustaining force. It doesn't have to be joy with a capital J. So I like the first time when I came back to Edinburgh and I got to sit in a coffee shop and have a latte oh. and, and write. Oh. And I'm somebody who before the pandemic, I can't, I could not write at home. I needed some kind of mental yes, barrier. Exactly the same barrier. as me. So all my books had been written in coffee shops, usually yes. one coffee shop per book. And then I had to learn how to write novels in the pandemic at home. And it was this like, I, I, it just, all of the boundaries in my mental space broke down and I was able to get the things done, but I felt like I preserved no, no safe space, no, no, no nesting, no, any of that. And so getting to actually like tr be back in a public space and write and have those noises that I didn't have to put in like an app in my ears to simulate coffee shop sound. It was just actual coffee shop oh. sound. I like first. Victoria, what an excellent idea. <laughs> right? You know, you have like the, the sound apps that will simulate. Uh, I've never shop. used one, but I'm going to investigate okay, okay, okay. immediately that we the, get off. <laughs> okay. The forest app, which is really actually good for anyone who's writing. It basically is a Pomodoro method where it grows little trees in an app. And then if you quit your writing session before the tree is grown, the tree dies. So it like forces you to stay off your phone. It has a sound bank and one, and there's like, it, there's like ocean sounds and there's rain, but one of them is coffee shop. And it is mind blowing and like completely just like saved my sanity for 16 straight months. So um, just... I actually don't own a phone. I don't well, own a phone. Well, that feels like an entirely different question. And also how? Um, I haven't owned one for like eight years. Um, and at the beginning, it's funny, about eight years ago when I first got rid of it, that was the question everyone asked me, like how on earth can yeah. you not own a phone? Last couple of years, people have started to say to me, gee, I wish I didn't own a phone. <laughs> like something has really changed on the internet uh, with um, smart technology. I think that's to do with the algorithm's ability to keep you online, whether you want to be there or not. It's just gotten so much better that we're starting to feel oh, yeah. a little bit uh, pressed. Um, but yeah, no, I don't have a phone and I have really drastic measures that I use to um, keep myself offline during the day. I actually own a time lock safe. So I put my modem into the safe at the beginning of the day and um, then you lock it, you choose the time interval um, and it won't open again until the timer runs out. <laughs> I can't so. decide if it's if it, it had to be that drastic for you to commit it to, to be that it. Drastic. Is that what it is? <laughs> it had to be that drastic. Oh my goodness. So do you write longhand then? Or what no, do you I, I write on a computer. 
Oh, okay. I, okay. Write, I write notes longhand, but I do write manuscripts on, yeah. on the computer. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, what I'll say is you can also find coffee shop sounds on your computer. <laughs> I'm like, I'll just download my mind it. is boggling, but also you're totally right. The gamification that exists on all forms of social media to keep you continually refreshing is like, I never notice it more than when I like check something, set my phone down and then immediately pick my phone back. Like I, it's like your system goes into like a little, just a little tiny loop. So, wow. My, my mind is boggling right now. Um, I'm in awe, just nothing but deep respect on the phone front because it, it, it it's like my oxygen tank. Um, okay. Getting back to it. I'm going to ask one more question. Then we're going to dive into the 19 that are in there. Um, so this kind of goes back to the, the, the the lock and the safe, like what is a writing day look like for you? What is, how do you structure your work day? It's very different in the pandemic than it was. So I think that I probably had a process that was quite similar to yours. I would get up, um, immediately leave the house and head to a cafe. I just take my writing tools with me. And then um, I'm a, it's like slightly a workaholic, which I'm sure you can relate. <laughs> um, and so um, once the cafe, I'd first of all, I'd find a cafe that would allow me to nurse like one coffee for four hours. Um, but those kinds of places that really just let you sit and linger, um, they would always be on the verge of going bankrupt because they had no other patrons other than me and my yeah. one coffee. So I'd be chasing these empty <laughs> venues. Um, then um, I used to get home, have dinner and then head out again. I would go to a hotel bar and write throughout through the night. Um, but uh, in the pandemic, I had to learn how to write at home. Uh, much, much more difficult. Um, I think it uh, just requires a lot more willpower to um, delineate. This is the beginning of my work day and I'm going to do no other tasks other than sit and concentrate on abstract concepts now for eight hours. It's hard. Um, it, it's really tough to do. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, now I... Um, I usually get up, uh, I'll begin my work day. Um, uh, and then, um, I'll break for lunch, um, and, uh, go for my <laughs> one hour allotted walk. Your and nature then, wanderer. Uh, return. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, and then, you know, sort of write for the, for the rest of the evening. Um, how much, yeah. how, I mean, that's so I, I used to measure my daily work in words written and now I measure it in time because I think there's a lot of time that's spent thinking and deleting and doing all kinds of other things but working that much of the day I mean what would be a normal would you do a chapter or a scene or a page or slow at producing yeah. manuscripts yeah um so uh i can on a really really good day i can probably get out about a thousand words oh, um wow. i'm just i'm just very slow and that's another reason why i need to plan everything i mean if you can only write a thousand words a day you just can't afford to <laughs> spend three months going in a wrong direction um i love it but it feels like it would be a very immersive experience though the rack the act of drafting then becomes like a deeper dive and I used to spend a lot more time um, doing, I guess what I would think of as experiential research. So I would try and go and experience as best I could um, things that were happening in my scene. You know, um, like if a character is very tall, I would stand up on a chair and have a look around. Uh, I try to go to locations that my book is set in or locations that resemble the one my book set in. Um, I went to London when I, uh, I'd already done a ton of research for the 1800s. Uh, and then I went to London to go and kind of stand in the places and like feel the atmosphere. And then when I turned up, like um, I'd been reading everything the 1820s, but for example, one of my key locations in the book just had this giant Amazon warehouse building built right on top of it. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, or, um, you know, there's a scene in Dark Rise where someone gets stabbed in the shoulder and so um, I bought a leg of lamb and a shoulder of lamb and I stabbed <laughs> I was going to say, please tell me you didn't get stabbed in the shoulder for this no. book, but I do appreciate you choosing in something that was um, already dead. Yeah. And, um, and so I used to spend kind of like a lot of time just trying to click into scenes or 
um, I guess what you might call rumination time, which I think is also another reason why I just cannot have the internet in my house. It just eats into rumination time. Any time that you, any interval of time, short interval of time that I might have spent ruminating, I would just spend on the device. Um, and so, um, yeah, so there's just a lot of that for me. And I, I think part of writing, this is a little ephemeral, but perhaps you'll be able to relate, is yeah. like, feeling like a sense of trueness of like oh yeah I got it that's the beat that's that's it I've clicked it but um so there's a lot of kind of feeling my way through the manuscript I write a sentence have I got it yet no I don't have it uh it's not the right feeling I ha it hasn't had the click yet delete yeah. tr and try another run at it um, yeah and so all of that takes kind of a lot of time for me Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Well, look, I'm going to dive into some of these questions for you. Um, and then obviously this is a spoiler free conversation, everybody. So please keep that in mind. Um, Deanna says, I love seeing your social media posts about research, the places you've traveled to fencing stuff, et cetera. And your writing always seems so well researched. Sorry, I changed words. I'm like that person who just changes descriptors. Your writing always seems very well researched. <laughs> what is one of the coolest things you've discovered or experienced while researching for your writing? Um, so, well, um, one of the, oh, I'll say something from Captive Prince and then I'll, I'll talk more seriously something from Dark yeah. Rise. When I was researching Captive Prince, I learned that it is not known to historians whether ancient Greek citizens wore underpants or not. They simply, there's just no historical record. They know that um, non-citizens wore lawn cloths, but they, they do not know what citizens wore under the chitons. Um, so that is a historical X-file. Um, for Dark Rise, um, I think one of the coolest experiences that I had um, was when I went, first when I went to London uh, and I booked, um, I booked, sort of, so I, I'd sort of already hooked up with a couple of historians uh, by the time that I went and one of them, uh, and I, I'd been messaging with a curator from the London Natural History Museum uh, and I was very interested in unicorns and the law around unicorns um, and they have a narwhal horn in the Natural History Museum. So uh, I got to not only look at it, but also touch it, which is very kind of rare and exciting. Yeah. And, um, and it, it really felt like a, a magical moment. Uh, one of the first um, quotes that I read um, was from a, a writer in the 1800s who was kind of cataloging what was known about unicorns until that time, Odell Shepard. Mm -hmm. And he wrote, I've hunted the unicorn chiefly in libraries. Um, and that line really stuck with me. Um, and, um, and when I got to the Natural History Museum and touched the unicorn horn, um, uh, the horn of the whale, the narwhal, that looks exactly like a unicorn horn in every <laughs> regard, and that they believed were unicorn horns until, uh, I guess, they realized they were fish tooth. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 it was almost like I stepped into my own book. It was really wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah, I um, I was like in my 20s when I learned that narwhals were not mythical creatures because I just assumed they were too cool to be real. Um, and for about the Assuming next- unicorn. Well, for the next like seven years, people just sent me narwhals. And they think I, they thought I was going to be like embarrassed when I found out because I definitely found out on the internet, like on social media uh, while talking about how much I love narwhals. And people thought I would be embarrassed, but I was like, no, this is just like proof that the universe has an amazing sense of humor. Like this is such a magical, like wonderful beast. So I love that you got to actually like touch one. I've obviously, I've seen um, narwhals in natural history museums and the horns just look so amazing. And also from a fencing component, because that is a thing that we have in common. Um, I was an epee fencer competitively for seven years. And I feel like from a fencing component, narwhals just, they kind of rule. It's just like um, sea stabby. <laughs> just for the audience, like Victoria and I had never met before uh, tonight's event, or at least not in person. But Victoria, I don't know if you remember this, but I think the first internet exchange that we ever had, you actually challenged oh. me to a duel. <laughs> yes, and we still haven't fulfilled it because we've still yet to meet in person. So That's the right. challenge <laughs> remains unanswered, but we will That's get true. there one day. You've thrown down the glove. 
I mean, I have, I have. And if you think about it, you wear masks while fencing. So I feel like it's got to be a fairly COVID safe activity. You're so right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. Anonymous attendee would like to know which character you think you are most similar to and which character you're most different from out of all the characters you've written or out of the characters in Dark Rise, if you'd like to narrow it. Hmm. I think that one, um, I, I'm really sorry to give such a weaselly answer to this question, but that one is so hard to answer because you create every character out of yourself. Like on some rare occasions, there's characters that you kind of force out because they're just so hor- like villains off. I often have to like, re- like full out villains, like um, say the villain in Captive Prince, I had to like uh, force out. Um, but um but protagonists, especially viewpoint protagonists, um, I'm writing them out of myself. Um, probably, you know, Captain Prince is a very personal book for me. Um, and so the two princes in that series, I guess, are, are, are like, are very close to me. Um, you know, Damon, I, I wrote out of, um, I guess, a kind of a particularly Australian ethnic identity as, as like someone from the Mediterranean basin you know, writing a, a kind of Greco-Italian character. Um, um, and um, so th- there was just like a lot of, of cultural aspects to his character that I really related to and a lot of the experiences that he was having that I also related to. Um, uh, whereas, um, whereas the character of Laurent, you know, um, I guess uh, I was also like just working through a lot of really personal issues from my childhood as I was writing him. Um, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of pieces myself in, in both those characters, but then it, it sort of, again, it moved also into dark rise. I think there's a piece of myself in every viewpoint character in dark rise. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. That one is really tough to answer. No, but it's honest. I think there's an idea that authors have like an avatar cleanly in the books, but for most of the time we're taking like a small piece of ourselves, something that, yeah. you know, or, or piece of like who we want to be or who we're afraid of being or a fear and ambition, something and kind of growing a new person out of it. Yeah. As that you know what so I find it- most fascinating is, um, I guess, uh, just because I'm genderqueer, I'm, I'm just always interested in, in gender uh, yeah. fluidity and gender questions but I always find it completely fascinating when women write those you know those very heterosexual romance novels that have um, especially the ones that are very stereotypically gendered with like often a weaker very feminine heroine and, a, yeah. and an alpha kind of powerful guy and and I just find it fascinating that both those characters came out of the thing. Oh, absolutely. Um, And it's like, oh, within her is both the powerful Duke and the, you know, fainting heroine as well. Um, Yeah. So it's, it's sort of like, you do have to push into facets of yourself to produce characters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Fiona would like to know, did you always know that you wanted to set Dark Rise in London? Yeah, I think, um, you know, part of what I, part of the origin of Dark Rise um, is its uh, conversation that it's having with these English fantasies that I grew up reading. Um, and I, I'm actually not sure, I'd be curious to hear like your thoughts as an American, but particularly as an Australian, you know, those novels are so clearly colonial <laughs> when they sit on us, <laughs> um, you know, and it's, it's just all the preoccupations of the Northern European id. Uh, you know, you've got the cold wintry North, uh, the the ice wall from Game of Thrones or, yep. you know, we don't have that here. Like our North is hotter than our South. We're in the Southern hemisphere, you know, the thick forests with the big beasts in them. We don't have that here. We've got wide open spaces. All our deadliest animals are really small. Like even that kind of European parochial occupation with a border, like a wall or a castle wall, like a Hadrian's wall. Um, or I know like Americans often building a wall or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Australians just don't like, we, we have no concept of a wall. Like we're an Island nation. Um, and, um, and you know, if you even plumb a level deeper, like Australia's like never had a medieval period yet fantasy mm-hmm. has all these tropes of a medieval world. So it's, it's just obviously Anglo European. Um, and so I felt that if I was going to be taking on uh, some of these tropes, then I did need to set my book in 
London in England. And then I purposely said it in the 1820s, kind of like the beginning of empire when England was kind of coming into its colonial power. That was a time when it just threw its tendrils out across the world and started to um, reshape the world in its own image. And then also just drag everything <laughs> that it could find back to London as though uh, creating this center of so-called center of Western civilization. Um, mm. And yeah, I, I, I was really interested in playing with those issues. And so um, that's where I set my book. Yeah, I did a similar thing in my Shades of Magic series, similar in that, you know, London is a almost a shorthand for a specific yes. kind of fantasy. And so yes. I, I made four Londons, but three of them are completely fictional and then I only spend like five minutes in the real London and then I just piece out to like three other Londons yeah. that call themselves London but are basically entirely different iterations of the city based on its relationships to magic but I definitely think there is this kind of like I grew up with those books I grew up with T.H. White and the ones in Future King I grew up with I mean obviously Dark is Rising and I and and C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and I definitely feel like there's this sense of like the well that's the proper setting for a, a novel about certain things. And you're like, well, it's, you have to, in order to play with that, you have to engage with it. Yes, exactly. I had the, I was having this conversation um, with Zen Cho uh, and, um, and, you know, she's originally from Malaysia. I'm, I'm from Australia. She, um, she was living in London and I was visiting. Um, and we're just kind of like, why are we, why are we setting our books in England? You know, why are we, and, um, and we came to this, sort of understanding that you know if you're from a colonized country at some point in your art you're going to fight the emperor <laughs> you're going to go to his <laughs> yeah. house and you're going to try and fight him um and so you know um, do you have that impulse as an American or is it all too kind of distant to you for you guys <laughs> I mean I don't know I think we have like a sense of the archetype I'm a, I'm a real like I'm a terrible American though because I'm half American and half English oh, and so course. I have no idea what is like what is the so I've never for a, a like, way it's caught between worlds for you yeah exactly I'm more used kind of to being like I don't really know what either side is doing right now <laughs> mm, yeah yeah oh man there are so many good questions and I know we won't get to all of them and I'm so sorry about that um Lindsay says when do you feel like you really wrapped your head around a character and really know them Hmm. I guess maybe um, what's that point where they stop feeling that's like really interesting. Template. So yeah, I had a real journey of writing characters because uh, you know I started my writing. The first writing I ever did was fan fiction. Yeah, and like those characters are fixed, <laughs> and you know the character coming in, and you're usually writing fan fiction about them because you love that character. So you just feel in your heart that you know every facet of their being. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it was a real shock to me that when I started to write original fiction that you can get characters wrong in a draft. <laughs> but sometimes you have to draft characters. They don't, they don't arrive fully formed at the, as, at the beginning of the manuscript, no. uh, the way that they did in fic. Um, <laughs> and so um, I had to really learn, like I was not an instinct, just like I was not instinctive at idea generation, I was not an instinctive character creator. Um, and so, um, you know, one of my processes that I do for gathering ideas, um, but, also for creating characters is to just think about all the things that I love and respond to in other works, um, write like a list of their qualities down and then see what I can construct out of those qualities as building blocks. Um, obviously if I'm responding it, it's, it's a way of learning about myself because if I'm responding it to it in someone else's work, it's because part of me is resonating with that thing. Um, and so, um, so I'll start to build the characters but they will be fuzzy at the beginning. So the click moment for me is usually when um, I can write a scene and I know exactly what they're going to do and what they're going to say. And it, it has that feeling of trueness to me. Um, it's like, oh yes, they're working now. Um, and especially when they start to resist me because I've plotted the book. <laughs> so there's things I need them to do, <laughs> but sometimes then they'll say like, but my characterization does not commit. Um, and then you have to look for something in their characterization that will allow them to do the thing you need them to do for the wider yeah. plot without breaking them or breaking your plot. Um, yeah. Definitely. No, I, I understand that completely. I, um, 
I always say like, it's that context moment. It's when, for me, when the character stops feeling like it's floating on the surface of the story or the world and more like when it sinks into the moment. So it's the moment where like, I can take a character and then create an optimum context for them. Where are they at home in their life? Like what is, what is their sense where they're like being their most self? And I think it's because for something like Shades of Magic, which is the easiest example, is like the first image I ever had for my two main characters was like one of them walking through a wall and colliding with the other one who was dressed as a boy who then robbed him. And like that moment, was defining for both of them and became a scene in the finished book. But it was like, I needed them in context. I needed them moving and speaking and to kind of see like the facets of them and how they were going to work in my world. They don't work statically. Yeah. Um, okay. What do you have, what advice do you have for writers who want to write long stories, but are so intimidated by the enormity of the prospect that they don't know where to start? Asks Marissa. So there's not, there's no easy answer advice, but here's what I can tell you out of my own experience. Like if you're, if you want to write a novel, you, you have to change yourself from someone who can't write a novel into someone who can write a novel. <laughs> and so that's going to require you to do like a bunch of different things. Um, it might be um, gain some new skills. Uh, if there's things that you specifically can't do like in terms of actual writing, um, then just going to need to like practice them and do them. Um, so, um, you know, I was talking about how I'm not natural at ideas. Um, um, you know, people have different things that they're instinctively good at in writing and things that they just suck at or can't do. For me, it's ideas. When you can't do something, that's when technique comes to the fore. So you need to learn some technique for how to do the thing you can't do instinctively. Um, so for me, for ideas, for example, I would do things like a, like a brainstorm, I use a 20 things method, uh, brainstorm 20 solutions to the problem. Uh, you'll get through the cliched ones in the first 10 to 15, and then the last five will start to be like the interesting ones. Um, I'll go out on like ideas grabbing missions, I'll look at art books, I'll just try and be open to like, how can this, how can anything that I'm experiencing in my life, like turn into a story? Um, so um, if it, it could be that it's personal things that need to change. Like if, uh, are you procrastinating? You know, do you need to take drastic measure, measures to like carve out the time? You'll never have more free time than you do right now. Uh, it's, it's about like learning to like prioritize that time. Um, uh, you know, it might be getting a writing friend to hold you accountable. You sit and write together or you have your, you know, your own screen with each other while writing or just anything, text each other before you start and then start. Um, then, um, yeah, so it might be like things that you have to work on in the self. It might be things that you have to work on in terms of craft. Um, but <clears throat> I also think that it's good to be realistic about like, it's actually really hard to write a novel. So if you're feeling that you're floundering, like this is so hard, I don't know where to start. It's like, yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> um, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You, you, you have to work on it for like at least a year. Most people take like five years that I know to write their first novel. Um, but everyone that I know that has kind of just sat in the chair and forced themselves to do the work over those years to or longer has produced a novel and gone on to sell a novel um, because others drop out. <laughs> like it's too hard. Um, and so, um, so, you know, if you, if you really want to do it, then, um, that's your process. Um, so maybe, uh, one good thing to do is something that, that I do, um, is I write a list of everything that's stopping me from writing my book. And, um, so write that list down. And then once you have your list, like, you, you know, your enemy, <laughs> then write a solution to every single one of those problems. <laughs> so you have something that you can like tangibly do to move forward in your journey, but like, good luck. Like I, I really, <laughs> I'm, I'm always keen to support new writers. And I think like, um, you know, it's a really hard task, but it's a really wonderful and fun task as well. So, um, I, I, I wish you the best on your writing journey and I can't wait to see what you come up with. To your points. Yes. I just want to add that, like, Every time I sit down, I'm convinced I can't write a novel either. So like, I think there's a certain amount of like mental um, 
traversing of a landscape that you have to acknowledge is like not a reflection on the fact that you're not up to the task. It's a reflection on the fact that the task is very hard and daunting. And I'm, I'm 21 books in and I still have to trick myself by breaking it down into smaller bites. So I will sit down and like think I can't write a novel because a novel is this massive mountain, but I know that I can like make tiny little hills. I just can't do a mountain. And so I'll break my book down into like five to 10 smaller escalating episodes, thinking of it almost like a season of television. And so if a season of television would have eight episodes that build to a climax, there are some like smaller adventures that are escalating in those episodes. So basically I have to like trick myself into thinking I'm not writing a book. I'm just writing like a short story that's going to lead into this short story that's going to hook into this one. So it's to say that like sometimes you just have to like trick your brain into putting one foot in front of the other as well. Yeah. A mantra that I use, but it's not useful for everyone <laughs> is it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be finished. <laughs> It's true though. It's true because you yeah. can't fix a blank page and you, you just fix nothing. <laughs> yeah. You think at some point you're like, I'm going to do it right the first time. I have yet to do it right the first time. You will always have to like make it better. Right. It doesn't have to, to your point, it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be something that you can then work with. Yeah. Um, okay. Ying, uh, amazing Ying draws from Instagram. Um, <gasps> Ying, yes, I love your artwork so much. Artist. Um, you mentioned that Captive Prince was a practice run. Are there any similarities, such as character traits, between the main characters of Captive Prince and characters in Dark Rise? So I have heard feedback from a lot of people that James is very similar to Laurent from Captive Prince. So obviously I feel that they're both unique, special snowflakes, vastly different from one another, but that is the feedback. that uh, Laurent is, it, James is kind of a bit like if Laurent was team evil and could do magic. Um, uh, I think some of the things that are similar is like, I do enjoy writing um, uh, characters that, um, how can I put this? See the world in like limited ways uh, and then have their world expanded through interactions with other characters, like learn to jump into a new perspective. Um, so in that way, I think that some of the character interactions that you'll encounter in Dark Rise are similar uh, to the ones that you'll encounter in Captive Prince. Um, my protagonist, Will, is absolutely nothing like Damon from Captive Prince, um, but they're both just trying to do their best in a crazy mixed up world. Definitely. Um, Tashi, to that point, Tashi would like to know which character came first when you were creating Dark Rise? Who did you start with? Um, I started with w Will. And um, I guess, well, how do I talk about this without <laughs> spoiling it? I started with Will. Uh, his character is like the premise, I guess. Um, and so he came first. And then um, I will say very mysteriously that it was then about building characters that had the most interesting interplay with him. Um, characters for whom his story was gonna have like the biggest impact. Um, and uh, you'll meet some of those in Dark Rides and some of them later on as the series unfolds. Um, Gabrielle asks if there are any specific lines out of Dark Rise that you really enjoy. And I would like to tack on, I'd like to just know also maybe if there's a scene, because usually there's like a scene or two that we really look forward to. Is there anything that you can kind of tease that you just like either in your planning, couldn't wait to write it or just thoroughly were swept up in the joy of writing it? Um, I'll say three very quickly. One is the ending of book one. So the book builds to that ending like a crescendo. Um, and I guess similar to the process that you were talking about, that was the goal that I had in mind, the thing that I was writing towards. Um, and uh, it was just exhilarating for me to, to set up the end and then to um, blow up the end. <laughs> Um, but then, um, in terms of smaller scenes, um, there's a scene where, how can I, uh, I guess this is a minor spoiler. So I'm just going to hold up my finger while I talk about this spoiler. And, um, <laughs> when I take my finger down, then it's very minor, but there's a scene where, uh, a character is, um, stabbed with a unicorn horn and, um, 
and uh, I had that scene in my mind for so long. I was really, one of the things that's so interesting to me about unicorns is the way that they're tied in. There's, they're these symbols of purity, but yet they have this like sexual aspect to them as well, where the horn is phallic and they're, they're always hanging around beautiful women. And um, and uh, there, there was just something so interesting and exciting to me about um, the phallic spear of the unicorn horn. So um, I was really excited to write that scene. And then um, there's a line in the book. Um, oh, actually, no, I'll just say those two. I don't, I don't want to spoil Okay, it okay, okay. I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. Everyone will have to read it in order to find their own favorite line and then come back to you later. And maybe we'll have in a future chat, you'll have to reveal some of your favorite lines. Um, anonymous question. Um, a lot of captive prints had characters looking back on their childhood and teen years and how their experiences formed them. When writing Dark Rise, how was it writing from a teen perspective and dealing with those experiences in real time? Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in the way the past affects who you are. Um, and, um, and, you know, I'm really interested in the way that trauma affects people, particularly um, the fingerprints that it leaves on us. You know, um, there's that twist on that line, that which does not kill us makes us stranger. I'm very interested in <laughs> that process. Um, and... Um, just as someone who, who's, I guess, had some pretty intense childhood experiences of my own, um, you know, I'm interested in the kind of strength that that calls upon. I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that like trauma makes you strong. I think you're usually strong before and that's why you can survive the trauma, but it does leave its fingerprints on you. Um, and so, um, so in Captive Prince, you know, we had two characters with very different childhoods that were really like born out of the, of their childhood sets of experiences. In Dark Rise, I guess I'm approached things differently. And a lot of the characters, particularly the main characters are descendants or even reincarnations of characters from the past. So they have a lifetime's worth of past events and trauma that has potential to affect them in the present now. Um, so in a way it's, um, kind of putting myself back into that teenage or childhood perspective where, you know, you're, you're in a set of really tough, difficult circumstances, something is pressing down on you from the past, um, maybe even that weight of generational trauma, uh, and you're processing it in, in real time now. It's, a, it's a kind of just a different way of getting at the same thing, I think. Yeah. All right. This is going to be our final question um, from Elizabeth. Um, so yes, I heard you say that you're genderqueer. How does your personal understanding of and relationship to gender impact the characters in Dark Rise? Hmm. Um, I think that I instinctively, um, hmm. well, I'll give a very honest answer to that. Something that I've learned writing Dark Rise. I actually find it extremely difficult to write cisgendered women because it's triggering for me <laughs> like I, it's I get very dysphoric writing them um but um I, I I did find it a good yeah and so um the even the women in Dark Rise are, are kind of like I started off with the best intentions but then they just all do I'm getting a lot of feedback of like oh this character feels very genderqueer I was like oh, oh well, <laughs> I did my best <laughs> um, um but um but um I I suppose also speaking really honestly, like often the creative space, my own writing, just one of my own, my only chances to um, inhabit the masculine fully. Um, so it's a, it is a form of gender escape for me. Um, and then, um, you know, interestingly, some, sometimes when things are really personal to you, you don't, you're, you're frightened of writing them or you're, you don't want to do them, particularly not in realism. <laughs> And so it's it's only very recently that I've started to write like explicitly genderqueer characters. Um, so, you know, or gender fluid or what have you. So there's Bobby and Fence. And then in the second book of Dark Rise, I think there's a character that's kind of just more exactly in my head. Um, but um, but I, I think I, I rewatched The Matrix 
Um, and it was my first time to watch it since the Wachowski sisters came out as trans. And I was just, just blew my mind how trans that movie is. <laughs> like, um, it's not just that every, no one is their body. Like everyone is, <laughs> has a separate avatar that's t- different from their physical body where they exist having a different life. And that the real world, their real body is way worse <laughs> than their mental concept of who they are. Yeah. Um, but it was also that, um, you know, Trinity and Neo are like, like, mirror image copies of one another like if you tick the gender clock like like line one side or the other of that line you get neo and over here you get but they're the same yeah. you don't see that in romance movies or you know that's out of the mind of a trans person i watched that and i was like oh i i do that i've got <laughs> in captive friends i've got laurent and your cast who just look the same um and um i've got characters like that also in dark rise um even the fact that like will is like blood of the lady i think is like slightly gender it just comes out in all these ways um uh probably i think i I see a lot of trans writers you know writing reincarnation writing stories where you move in and out of one body or another i think it's like it's just a it's a trans set of interests um so all of that is in my work as well I love it. I love the term gender escapism as well, because I feel like that is maybe one of the most like perfectly phrased ideas as well as somebody who writes a lot across the across gender lines, I would say, and in gender fluid spaces and wondering why I so comfortably embody those more than I would embody like I have very, I have very few like cisgender women in my books for yes, a reason. I think. Probably for um, uh, like perhaps for similar reasons. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for very similar reasons. And I, I love that sense of escapism. And you're right, this is fiction. And this is one of like the safest places to play sometimes and to enact. And as somebody who just watched The Matrix again for the first time in like 10 years, a hundred percent right on all fronts there. Um just yeah. A gr- uh, yeah, very, very obvious. I think it's one of those times, again, where the ingredients show through in the meal in a really beautiful way. Yes. Um, well, CS, I, as someone who's enjoyed this meal, thank you. I love this book. I can't wait for book two. I hope that everyone enjoys it. I'm selfishly just excited that I got to have the time to chat with you. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a really wonderful conversation and like a real privilege for me um, to chat with someone whose work I've admired for such a long time. So thank you very much, Victoria. Hey, thank you both so much. I'm so sorry to like be the bearer of bad news that we're out of time. I could listen to the two of you (laughs) do this for just like the rest of the night. Just fantastic. Uh, Well, everybody, thank you so much for coming out tonight, um, for attending this event. Um, If you want to pick up another copy of Dark Rise for a friend, uh, we've got, you know, plenty of them at the store. So please come on by, get uh, get them at brooklinebooksmith.com. We've got all of uh, CS's other books. We have Victoria's other books. Um, So yeah, we're we're open for browsing. So please come on by. Um, But And you're everybody who got a book. um, It will be coming as soon as possible. I promise we're trying. (laughs) Uh, But Victoria, CS, thank you so much again. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, and I would love, just love to say thank you everyone for coming along. It was, um, it was wonderful to have a chance to hang out and chat with you and celebrate the release of Dark Rise. Um, so thanks everyone. And I hope that you enjoy the book. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great night.